Hi, I'm Dr. Tony Mork, author, speaker, inventor, uh, endoscopic spinal surgeon, and dedicated exclusively to the practice of endoscopic spine surgery. Today, I'd like to talk a little bit about why someone might have foraminal stenosis after they've had a cervical fusion. This might be a little confusing for people since they say, well, gee, you know, I, I had a cervical fusion for a disc herniation or stenosis a few years back and uh, everything went great for a few years, but now I've got pain that's going into my shoulder and into my arm. Is it coming back with the fusion or what's going on? Well, let's just take a little review of, of what happens with the uh, cervical stenosis. And just remember that the cervical spine is comprised, like the rest of the spine, with vertebrae sandwiching or the cushions or the discs. And let me just mention one thing. When people talk about which disc that they're trying to figure out, we always talk about it in terms of a pair of numbers. So we have six, seven, and we have you know five, six. And the reason we talk in terms of pairs of numbers is we're talking about the, the vertebrae as being number five and six. The disc is the one that's sandwiched between those two. So normally you can see that if you've got five, really essentially five discs here, that any motion of the neck, of course, and moving it, it maybe a little easier to see in this model here. So you can see that we can see a little bit more motion with this smaller model and if someone is flexing their head forward or if they moving their head backward or even turning it a little bit from side to side, uh, the disc is the place where this motion is occurring. And uh, we can see that the main brunt of the motion is being taken up by the disc and the ligaments in these areas. So whether we're leaning our head back or flexing your head forward, the disc is what is going to be giving rise to most of the motion. Well, let's take a look and see what happens when you have a fusion. Okay, well let's just say that we have a fusion indicated by this blue clay here and the uh, fusion goes over these two levels. The 4-5 disc has been bridged and the 5-6 bridge, the disc has been bridged. The 5-6 disc has been bridged by the fusion. And the fusion here is a combination of uh, usually some kind of graft or implant and then implant to stabilize it so there's no motion. Well, even though there's no motion occurring at those particular disc segments, motion of the neck is still going to continue to occur. Even though there's no motion occurring at the fused segments, motion of the neck is still going to occur. People are going to still rotate their head from side to side. They're going to try to flex and extend their neck in spite of having a fusion, like you probably have been doing. But the place where the motion has to occur has now been limited. We've eliminated two of the discs, which means that any additional motion has to be picked up by the other remaining discs. And of course, if you're trying to, if you've already taken away some, then some accelerated wear uh, will be occurring at these other levels, the ones that are still open and available to move. And this really turns out to be the source of what people refer to as adjacent disc disease. In other words, once these have been fused, the adjacent discs above and below the fusion uh, can get overworked. And it's been shown that they will degenerate uh, in about 25% of the cases or a little bit more than that, 10 years after a cervical fusion has been performed. Well, what happens when they get overworked? Well, a couple of different things. One, they can actually collapse or settle. So you can see on this smaller model here that if the disc was to collapse, it also it has a possibility of extending into this foraminal canal. And the foraminal canal is where that nerve actually comes out. So if I just do that, you can see that this is, this is tending to squeeze and trying to squeeze my little probe out of there. But the same thing happens to a nerve as well. So uh, on this one side, if the disc is degenerated or starts to narrow, it can start to actually 
extrude into the foraminal canal. The other thing that can happen is if the disc uh, starts to collapse or we get some arthritic changes of the facet joint here. Remember, this is the facet joint. So if you get some arthritic change, the facet joint, and there's some overlapping bone. Remember, if you, if you think of someone, uh, maybe your grandma, who's got uh, arthritic changes of her fingers and she's got those knobs on her fingers, those are osteophytes from the finger joints. Well, the same kind of thing can occur here. And as those knobs or, or extra bone or osteophyte grows into the foraminal canal, that's another source uh, of squeezing the exiting nerve root. This is how someone with a collapsing disc space could end up with foraminal stenosis, either with the disc or degenerative disc or the calcified disc osteophyte complex could actually start encroaching on the foraminal canal and pushing on the exiting nerve root that actually goes out to the shoulder, arm, forearm, or hand. And uh, this is how foraminal stenosis can occur even though the person's had a previous cervical fusion. And if this does turn out to be a problem, by the way, it's uh, oftentimes uh, easily addressed with an endoscopic decompression, uh, which can be performed from the back side. Remember, the fusion was performed from the front side, and there's no need to go back there. In the event of foraminal stenosis, uh, it can be approached from the back side, and I'll show you right here. So just remember that foraminal stenosis is oftentimes addressed from the posterior or the backside. And just by removing a portion of the facet joint, often is able to remove any bone or osteophyte on the inside. If there's any residual disc, the nerve is actually free to ride over this, oftentimes solving the uh, uh, stenosis issue. Just by removing a small portion of the facet, uh, maybe 40, 50, 60 percent, which does not remove the entire facet, but enough to allow the nerve to pass free through the foraminal canal and then out to the shoulder, arm, or hand area. That's how foraminal stenosis can occur and what can be done to resolve it uh, after a fusion. Uh, if you've got any more questions, please visit me at drtonymort.com. And uh, thanks for watching. All right, take care.